One, two, three, four. This is Todd Dammit Kearns. He's a Canadian boy and bassist for Slash featuring Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators. Raised near Saskatoon, Todd was mainly self-taught with a love for punk and metal, but was able to carve himself out a career as an elite bass player, guitarist, singer-songwriter, frontman, and all-around high-energy positive human. I really only met him briefly a few years back in Argentina when Duff McKagan's Loaded supported the Conspirators. Also on that bill was Gilby of GNR. Before Slash and the Conspirators, as most bandmates of rock and roll legends, Todd already had an accomplished rock resume, playing with bands like The Age of Electric, Static and Stereo, Go Time, Faster Pussycat, and Sin City Sinners. On top of that, in 2013, Todd joined fellow Canadians Brent Fitz, also of the Conspirators, and Chris Jericho from Fozzy in the Canadian cover band Coverboy. And check this out. In 2014, Todd was voted by Loudwire readers as the bassist of the year in the fourth annual Loudwire Music Awards. Pretty cool. Another career highlight was in 2015 when Todd played guitar for Michael Monroe. Fast forward to July 2018, Kearns received a star on the BC Entertainment Walk of Fame. That's rad. I mean, who gets a star? These days, Todd's rocking in a new band called Minefield, with Brandon Fields, Jeremy Asbrock, and Matt Starr, who I've also interviewed on this channel. Besides Minefield, Todd has his own interview talk show on YouTube, much like myself. It's called Todd Kearns Talks To, where he has insightful chats with his longtime heroes and legendary rock and roll friends. It's straightforward with no tricks, just his positive personality showing off his vast rock history knowledge and his appreciation for where he is now and the long and winding road it took to get him here. Go check it out as soon as you can. But first, let's get to know him better. Another fantastic man, human being. Ladies and gentlemen, on the vocals and the bass, make some noise for Mr. Todd, damn it, Kurz. There it is, it's the man yeah. cave. Man cave. The shredder shed. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I'm really like, uh, just, I do a little bit of research, try to get to know the people I'm talking to, you know, and they're all just gigantic folks, but I love your show, first of all, because I'm... Oh, thank you. Number one, I'm like, in Loaded, I'm like the weird shy guy, like, I'm known as the, uh, Duff knows me as the guy who takes off, like, when we're in um, the Andes Mountains, and I find the only place that's showing the Raider game, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or Costa Rica or whatever, so... Talking to people is really, um, it's like going to the gym. It's very, it's very uh, difficult. But to watch you do it, I mean, you're so like free flowing and you're really intelligent and um, well, I appreciate the questions that. are, you know, great. And I, even when you're talking to your heroes, you know, you seem very calm. Well, thank you. It's, it's, yeah. it's such a funny thing. Let me just grab some, I'm going to close the lines. Oh, geez, Louise. Yeah. I'm so much better at this, but I'm like, I'm facing you know, all kinds of challenges. Yeah. No uh, sweat. Two seconds. No, I really appreciate you saying that because it's such a weird, you know, it's it's a weird thing. Any you know, any sort of like conversational, um, and I, I kind of initially was a lot more weirded out by. It. Like just the other day, I talked to, oh, I was talking to Evan Stanley, Paul Stanley's son, you know, and it's like he's a, you know, it's kind of a bit challenging because you're like, well, he's not really other than being Paul Stanley's son, and you don't want to fucking bum him out by spending a whole hour going like, so, you know, it's like, <laughs> tell me about your dad. Yeah, it's like he's an artist. He's, he makes music and stuff like that. So I kind of wanted to make sure we uh, 
spent most of it on him. But, you know, every once in a while, I get kind of nervous. Mark Farner, I don't know where these people reached out to me, like Grant, Mark Farner from Grand Funk. And I was like, oh, wow, OK. Hmm. So, you know, but, you know, I, I initially used to take notes. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I used to actually take like, you know, we'll talk about this and then we'll talk about that. You know, like David Letterman with his little cards, you know. But then I just sort of went like, you know what? I think it's better if we just kind of, you know, there's things we have to touch on. And, yeah. and if I can move sort of semi chronologically, at least that way, most of it gets touched on. Um, but it's sort of, uh, you know, it's still conversational as opposed to like, because people keep saying like, I liked your interview with, you know, and I'm like, I don't consider these interviews. I consider them yeah. literally like Zoom chats with my friends, you know. Did you start when everything went down or did you start before that? No, it was when everything went down. Okay. We started doing a thing. I, I have a side band called Took. Uh, it's a Canadian thing with my friends. Um, Brent from Slash's band. It's all these Canadian guys playing Canadian cover songs, actually. So um, we just started like getting together every Tuesday and doing this thing and then talking to like different Canadian artists and whatnot. And then, and then every Thursday, I just started doing my own thing, like just literally talking to my friends, like uh, which has sort of grown into, like I say, it's suddenly like, Mark Farner or, or a few of those people have reached out and been like, well, his people reached out and I'm like, sure, of course, I'd love to talk to them. I, I It initially was supposed to be set up as like, I know these people, but I love listening to their stories. Um, I was playing in this thing in, in Vegas called Raiding the Rock Vault. And it's all guys like Howard Lease from Heart yeah. and Blas Elias from Slaughter and all these wow. guys from different things. And, and I would just sit there and like listen to, you know, I sort of needle them for stories and i thought man people would love to hear these stories because it's never you know it's it's never a, a, a direct line i picked up a guitar and then i became a rock star the end you know no <laughs> no no we'll get to that for sure yeah exactly are those exactly. those aren't vegas guys are they blass and uh howard lee's Ve blass is a vegas guy oh, really? um but uh howard is an la guy for sure calabasas no i think he's malibu i think he's a malibu guy do you know a guy Named Tony Fredianelli. He's a good um, uh, Las sounds Vegas familiar. Guitar. He was third eye blind guitar player uh, in yes. uh, second record through maybe five years ago. Blonde, spiky. Blonde. Okay. It, we we had a, a side project outside of third eye blind in the in the mid aughts, and uh, he took me out to Vegas and I met some Vegas folks or whatever. I wasn't too familiar with. It. I'm just saying he he was kind of an old school. I think he had a Prince cover band there when he was younger, and so he knew yeah. about the Vegas stuff. Yeah, there's a whole thing here. It's kind of why I'm still here, honestly, is even though I haven't really been much a part of the local scene for the past, well, you know, for quite a while now, but it's sort of like when I come back here, it's sort of a nice feeling that it's like, you know, like somebody can call and go, hey, what are you doing? It's Wednesday night. Do you want to come down and sit in, you know, and go home with a few bucks? And I'm like, you know, there's a scene here. Well, except for COVID, but there's generally yeah. a sort of a scene that, you know, kind of like when I say scene, it's like you walk into a casino, there's like, there's a showroom, there's a, a piano lounge and a restaurant that has a, an acoustic guy. Like there's, you know, a million places to play. Um, not necessarily the most artistic um, outlets, no. but, but still it's, you know, as a musician, it's sort of like I was, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, if I, if I'm not working Wednesday night and there's a chance I can go home with $400 or whatever, I'm like, yep, I'm that guy, get my yeah. lunch pail and go to work. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I've known some I, heavy I kinda... hitter dudes in, based in Vegas, and when I go to visit or whatever, they're, hey, come on down to the casino, I'm playing tonight, you know, or whatever, just in between tours. It's just like that's the Absolutely, way it is. Absolutely, yeah. A lot of touring guys do, I'll turn on the light here, a yeah. lot of touring guys do do a lot of, you know, have like local, uh, what do you call it, just local like residency type gigs and stuff like that. And I think that's important to, uh, you know, if you could balance that, because the weird thing that I've learned about Vegas, though, is it's it's ever changing and it's like, you know, you think you're rock solid because this venue is, you know, we're killing it. And, and then all of a sudden the venue, you know, or the hotel gets sold or new management and they'll just, you know, you're just gone. And it's like, but we're killing it in here. And it's like, that doesn't matter. It's not really yeah. about any of that, you know, but that's the music business in general, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. When, Flush, when you, you know. Yeah. When you started your show, did you have a, a concept in mind that you wanted it to be <clears throat> more of a long-term thing or did you, did you do one or two and you're like, wow, um, you know, I'm getting some pretty cool heroes here. I better keep going. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it initially, like I said, was just sort of like me, you know, before I was actually recording them in Zoom form, mm -hmm. how much I enjoyed listening to these guys' stories. And I thought, I just think, I think I'm the kind of guy I love hearing the stories of how guys, you know, got to where they, you know, where they are. And, and, and that means like, 
the ups and the downs, you know yeah. what I mean? Like the kind of like, you know, all things were going great, then stuff went sideways, you know, like it, uh, so many of my friends' stories are like, then the 90s happened, you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> and they all got kind of sidetracked. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's good. And I think my intention was always to sort of have that kid in, um, you know, Des Moines, Iowa, or some, some, you know, remote place going like, I want to do what these guys are doing. Um, and it's like, well, you kind of have to, you have to be your own cheerleader. You have to kind of pick yourself up by the, by the bootstraps and just yeah. do it. You know what I mean? So I, I think that's sort of the general, it doesn't mean you have to move to LA or you have to move to New York. You have to move to London or wherever you kind of, you know, whatever your local big city is, but it just means, you know, you really have to kind of do it. It's different these days too, because as you know, we live in a different time where the internet has changed everything and yeah. record companies are, it's not, not the same as it was. Did you go Canada, LA, Vegas, or Canada, Vegas, or how did how did you end up in Vegas from Canada? It was uh, essentially Canada, Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, although I've spent a lot of time in New York and a lot of time mm -hmm. in LA, I never put down roots in those places. I just yeah. worked there a lot. Um, the Vegas thing was just sort of like I always say I never really moved to Vegas. I just sort of randomly came and stuff just got busy and you know i was sort of bouncing back and forth i was literally bouncing back and forth until the slash thing happened then it was sort of like you know you get sucked out into the vortex and <laughs> yeah you know, that sort of changed that game but uh uh yeah so largely it's you know the part of me is kind of like we every time i go to la we often sort of go well maybe it would be you know would make sense to kind of put down roots out there but I, i'm such a uh I'm such a realist when it comes to like not a negative i'm not cynical in any in that way but i'm sort of like look i vegas is like i can hop in the car right now and be there or i could be in la in about three and a half hours if i just yeah. want to you know go there and i do it all the time you know we just did it the other day i had to go out for uh some rehearsals and uh you know it just sort of uh, if vegas is sort of a distant suburb in, in and of itself it's more yeah. affordable we can you know like i said and i like the fact that there's you know music and, and different musicians and some of the best musicians that, that i know are out here doing stuff you know and keeping busy and we're kind of looking out for each other in a funny way like everybody's kind of like you know we know who's great we know who's awesome and not that isn't always just the best musician but he's a great person and yeah you know how that goes it's like you know sometimes the guys who get the gig it's not necessarily he's the you know, he's there's lots of guys who are better players. But Can he hang out on long van trips? You know, exactly. Without freaking out? Yeah. It, is, his, is his wife a disaster? Is he a drug addict? Is he an alcoholic? You know, all those kind of things that come into play. Yeah. I've been through the let's take our best friend as our tour manager on the road thing ending in catastrophes. Oh, it, you it, know. it's the same <laughs> as probably going into business with your best friend. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, it's kind of like it's tough, you know what I mean? Especially in that world. That's why I kind of, you know, it's hard to vouch for people because you're like, you know, unless they're sort of a seasoned uh, long term road guy, then you're kind of like, yeah, that's the guy. Get that guy. But bringing your friends out, which is always the way we start. Yeah. And it sucks because you got to, like, tell your friend he can't be the merch guy anymore because we're going to get a proper merch guy. You know, That's sort of always can only last for so long. There's always some incident where they get fired always. in the middle of a tour and some guy has to <laughs> the wolf from pulp fiction has to swoop in from the label and clean everything up and finish the tour out I've done that a few exactly times. <laughs> well it's always that way when it's kind of like i mean i'm a boring i'm, I'm so boring but it's kind of like i remember back in the day when it was like so you're driving tonight so don't drink you know like whichever random guy and it's like dude what <laughs> you were supposed to not drink yeah. <laughs> sorry dude you know they were giving out free shots and you're like really dude like you know so you had one you job know, yeah you had one <laughs> job exactly yeah yeah it's sort of a it's it's there ain't nothing easy about about any of it it's you know it's 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 people think that the music business is 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 you just put on a guitar and go play and mm -hmm. and girls and and money it's like no it's it's the, the odds of actually being able to have a career are are uh you know, like even guys who, who have had massive success will have it for a brief amount of time that it will just phase out. Being on stage and doing that thing that everyone dreams of is actually like the easiest part. You know, it's all the stuff surrounding it, building up to it. Exactly. Maintaining, maintenance. I mean, as, as a friend of mine always says, he goes, you know, I do the playing part for free. It's everything else you got to pay me for. <laughs> so I, I totally agree. It's like waiting in airports and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And 
you know, sleeping on someone's floor back in the day. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's different now, but it's, you know, it's, it's part of the character building, you know, I think my character's built enough as far as that goes, I guess, but yeah. it's never too late. It's never too late to start over. That's, that's the way this business works. You could probably write a book. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's uh, in the queue. Yeah. I I've, I've thought of it. I just, I just don't know if anybody needs that book. <laughs> like I said, yeah. I'm a relatively boring guy. I, I'm boring enough to though to have kept my senses together to watch it all. So I guess that's yeah. maybe my perspective might be kind of uh, worthwhile. I don't know. Speaking of Howard Lease, I mean, that's the reason why I started the channel. This thing in the first place is more or less like therapy. I was Roger Fisher, the, original, the OG heart guy, was yeah. on some people to start another. Out in Seattle, there's like 20 heart cover bands, and they're all making money. Oh, sure. that, in, that includes Michael DeRozier and Fossen, and they're all doing something, you know, and Anna and Nancy, are, they're all doing something. And, and Roger found me through a friend, through a friend or whatever, and we're rehearsing. We're getting ready for this big tour. And on night one of the first uh, show of the tour, I rolled my van Damn. coming back home. Um, so I got ejected, I had spinal cord surgery, and I was paralyzed for a few days. Um, it's called C6 <clears throat> incomplete, but I've been able to work myself back to I'm playing again. Like I can play out, I teach. Great. Um, How long did that take? About a year and a half of like That's hardcore a everything electricity, blood flow restriction, yoga you know, pain meds, whatever. I'm, a, I, I'm doing everything out of desperation, but I'm finally at a point where I'm like really fine tuning it now. Like I'm, I'm going back and I'm starting to, starting to play fusion again. Like I never thought right. like lying in a hospital and you can't, you can't even move your fingers like that. Wow. You know? And so now I'm like, I throw my drum kit across the room when I practice at night. Cause I can't do like 30 second note shuffle things with my foot that i used to do when i was 14. <laughs> right right so yeah i'm just i'm kind of defragged um so there's a lot of frustration anyway so i was like at like my darkest point i was like what if i reach out to like the dudes who made me want to play rock in the first place you know and just on a whim you know i'm not a talker i'm not a rock biographer or something so i just i reached out to a couple people like martin chambers from the pretenders is my all-time Number one guy, like that made me want to play rock is that first Pretenders record, you know. And he's the he, best. They got back and he's like, Yeah, let's do it. I was like, Oh god, That's so now, awesome. now what do I do? You know. Yeah, and exactly. He was super um uh honest and gracious and after a while and this is where I started to learn how to do this more because I wish I had that interview over again. <laughs> Cause he, you know, right. he, he lit up a stogie and he had a glass of whiskey after a while, and he's really he, he started to get a little emotional. And I, I was so um, really? con conscious of his time that I was rushing the questions because I had sure. so much to get to. I was such a fan. Sure. And I wish I, you know, I, I should have been more going with the conversation, but um, it ended up being like an hour and a half. And he was, I was bringing up weird backstage stuff from Live Aid, and he's like, "Who is this guy?" <laughs> um, but then like Chris Franz from Talking Heads and, and Dave Barbaro from Bow Wow Wow was like the next week and I was like wow I wasn't now I have to know how to do this like now I have to know how to edit iMovie I have to I have to do this better you know and, and it's mainly yeah like, I, uh, I don't really mess with that stuff I'm sort of like <laughs> this is the conversation yeah here it is you know so I, I realize when I listen to like say Mark Maron or someone like that, you know, like those podcasts, I don't even call mine a podcast. People keep calling it that. I go, dude, it's just literally a chat, but, um, I kind of, I've always liked the punk rockness of it's just literally a long, you know, just conversation. And sometimes it'll veer off into, you know, stuff that's not relevant or somebody's phone rings or whatever's going on. And I kind of go that ah, it's, you know, part of the charm is, is, the, is the naturalness of it. But, but if you can learn that kind of stuff, and I think it's always good to, to teach yourself a new skill anyway, I'm just so fucking lazy. I just, I, I can't get around to it. As I move into showering you with love, because anyone who tunes in to this will want to know more about you and not me, which I have learned from critics and obsessed fans of people I've interviewed. Right. King's X, to just to mention one. Um, stop talking, imagine. interviewer. Make Let Jerry talk more. Um, they keep doing that to me too, but I'm like, <laughs> well, it's a conversation. So what are you going to do? You know? Yeah. Uh, and you don't know how much it took to get him here. Um, yeah. anyway, I loved the, okay. I loved the, the, the Richard Fortas thing because I related to that one the most coming from more of like, a new wave 
I was an '80s kid. Yeah. K, K Rock 106.7. Um, you know all the synthy bands, mm -hmm. Psychedelic Furs, uh, um, Tears for Fears, U2, Simple Minds, Missing Persons, all this kind of weird jangly stuff. That's where I came from. So like when I finally ended up in this like Guns N' Roses kind of camp, I wasn't. Fortunately, I wasn't like, oh my god, here I am. I was like, this is cool. Like, it's no different yeah. than playing a rock beat from this other stuff I already learned, but I'm just not obsessed with it, you know? Right. I can, I can deal with it without being gaga o o over all that stuff. So, But you, sure. you mentioned yourself, like, you got to stop uh, talking yourself down so much. Like you said, you, you have this screwdriver, of, you know, as opposed to a tool belt. I mean... <laughs> These yeah, guys have was, tool belts, but considering your background, you know what I mean? Maybe I'll give it to you. Like... That's why you're here. I'm here. <laughs> All right. I'm going right. to turn the tables. Yeah. I'm going to turn the tables because I've done enough, a little bit of research, you know, and you're just an incredible singer. You've been oh, a front right, man. Yeah. You're a songwriter. I'm sure you're an arranger. I'm sure you produced bands. You've, you've done the whole thing and you ended up as a very confident piece in like a legends band, you know, rock solid on your thing. And, what that does with all your background does is just give you that much more freedom on stage to just to just go off rather than being nervous about what you're doing because you have such well-rounded influences, right? And that's what I see as a guy on the outskirts who can walk through an airport with Duff or go through hotels or whatever, but I can disappear into the crowd so easily until right. I can get backstage. And I observe these bands like um, the, the previous slash bands or conspirators or um the outs the 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 offshoots of guns and roses stuff it's never like oh these dudes but i want it for me but there's this legend it for me it's always like i know all of these dudes had the long and winding road and they deserve this respect and i'm sure they can all do really front any band they wanted to you know they're playing the script and they're living the dream and that's awesome well yeah it, it's funny because in the slap, it's funny when you say that because I, I was a massive Guns N' Roses fan. I was I was a massive. Uh, it was just part of my DNA. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it was uh, especially Appetite because I you know I've always said Appetite. You know, although Nevermind changed a great deal of things later on, Appetite changed things in in a different way. Um, you kind of have to think back to how the hair was bigger and the you know, lots of like very colorful things. And then guns came in and it was like a street rock kind of thing. So, um, but, but I had put in the 10,000 hours, you know what I mean? Like a, <laughs> a, within reason, you know, I mean, I had killed myself to, uh, to, uh, you know, in, in, not in a bad way. I mean, like I, I, I would never say like, I, it wasn't something I, I enjoyed. I, I, I love playing music. I love touring. I love all that kind of stuff. So when something like that presents itself, I show up and uh, and it's funny because I talked to Duff about this too because Duff is, although he's the bass player in Guns N' Roses, he's also a he's a singer in his own right. He's a drummer. He could play guitar. So his relationship to everybody is multifaceted. You know what I mean? And I uh, I feel a very a kinship with that because for me it's like when I'm standing there. I'm not just kind of going one, two, three, four, two, two, because you know, so I'm just trying to play along. Yeah. It's like, I am very much in the center of it. Um, obviously the bass player's position with the drummer is, is, you know, interlocked. Um, and then with Slash carrying the entire thing in and of himself. And then Frankie and I being the rhythm section over on the other side with his guitar playing. And then Miles and I are singing harmonies the entire show. So it's my, I have this relationship with each guy in the band that's sort of very um, unique unto itself that probably doesn't really exist from the other guys to each other in in a different way you know what i mean hmm. um so but for me it, it, it's i wouldn't it, it, it's incorrect to say it's not challenging because but it's like if it's what you do you know what i mean like it's like if i was a an accountant and you needed me to do your taxes i could do that you know what i mean i can't do that and you should never ask me to do that but when it comes to showing up and playing and you know, and, and knowing the stuff and bringing my A game as much as I can, I'm going to do that. You know what I mean, and I, I think that that's if there's any lesson for anybody, you know, young people out there or whatever, it's sort of like you you just have to you have to kind of be prepared and and remain prepared and continue to, uh, um, if you're, you know, 
we're all, we're all aware of our own shortcomings or whatever, you know, what we're, I'm killing it on, you know, I'm doing, I feel really comfortable here. I'm a little miss in a short of the mark in this area here or here. And that's where you have to, um, and you just kind of have to keep working at that, you know? And so for me, yeah. it's, it, it, it's something that like, I'd been working on since I was a kid, like literally being able to play and sing without it being, you know, uh, like I was able to kind of split my brain into like growing up with Sting and, and, and guys like that, like being able to play bass lines that don't really jive with the vocal. You're like, and it would really fascinate me because it wasn't like in some instances, if you're playing uh, an instrument and you're singing a song, um, sometimes those two instruments don't jive, but that's because what the instrument you're playing wasn't being played by the person singing it where sting or mm. getty lee or any of those kind of guys are playing things and singing at the same time that you really kind of and i'm not getty lee by any stretch of the imagination yeah. I, I really come from a punk rock background but there's still a lot to be said about being able to play solid lines and not veering too far fast or slow or whatever and being able to kind of carry your vocal part so like i said it's like i step into that position and i feel ready for it so it takes away the nervousness like i don't i don't really get nervous about playing music i've always been very comfortable getting up and doing it because it's it's what i like to do you know it's like i, I yeah i, I saw that really queen i saw the queen video the uh oh yeah that's <laughs> pretty cool there's no uh, yeah. lack of confidence there that's well that's it's i mean it's also a certain amount of like uh showmanship maybe that's why i'm in vegas you know it's the whole idea of like growing up watching you know like as a kid, I was, uh, I've, I've said this a million times, but I, I, I was obsessed with Kiss and the Beatles and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I, I really, in a weird way, have, I have, I kind of find it difficult to call Kiss a, an, uh, an influence. Of course, they were an influence in terms of like that rabbit hole of rock and roll. But I don't think I really equated the idea of like, I can do that spit fire and fly and you know like as a there was it was a band but there was like you know we were kids we it didn't really kind of equate the beatles were like from outer space you know what i mean like that was something that just seemed unattainable you know in any way shape or form it wasn't until punk rock and the who and bands like that that i kind of stumbled into where i was like you know but the showmanship aspect is like no one wants to go see there's a certain amount of confidence whether it's faked uh not faked but sort of like you have to put on a brave face and go out there and do your thing, you know? So there are, there are times I go out there and I'm like, I can't hear myself. Mm -hmm. I, but I, I, no one in the audience needs to know that I can't hear myself. They don't need to be like, I, turn it up, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I watch people do that. And I'm always like, Oh dude, yeah. it's like the, the audience just reads that and just goes like, you know, just finds yeah, this. I cover my face. Like, stop, shut up. Just keep going. Yeah, the, shut up. The, the nervous energy of it all just goes like, it's not, uh, it's it's not how I do things, and I and I was sort of like when I was young, I was playing in bands with with much older guys, and they sort of had this sort of like, um, they didn't really have a rule book, but there was sort of an idea of like this is how we do it, and they were very sort of like you don't turn your back to the audience, mm. you don't walk in front of the singer, all kinds of weird little things like that that I've always kind of retained, um, but uh, but they're not like they're not like the law, you know, it's just kind of like, I, 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 well, I understand that. They also said they don't like, they don't, they didn't like people, us talking to each other on stage. You know, like when you're playing, you're leaning over and you go, yeah. you're just talking about something. Good chord, I buddy. See, yeah. You know, chord. And I see the stones do it all the time. I see Ronnie and Keith just kind of giggling together and I go, yeah. I love that. I, you know, so yeah. there's all kinds of things that you sort of like that are put on you and you take them and other ones you just kind of like, I don't need to know that. I'll, I'll just do my thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back to back to my screwdriver comment. Now it's you know we have these heroes who you just think, man, they just have this endless amount of talent in any um, category of their instrument. But I think, like you said, I'm just this one thing. I believe that if you made it to a certain level of experience of touring or recording, that you have a superpower of some kind. And I think like even though you're the screwdriver. <laughs> your your screwdriver is most likely, in my opinion, better than the master's screwdriver because he has all this other stuff, right? Right, like, right, okay. Like if I were to, you know, have my ego out of control right now, I'd say my right foot was probably my superpower. Right. So, you know, like I just talked to Hunt Sales a, a, a couple weeks ago or whatever. And it's One like, of my all-time favorites, yeah. Hunt Sales. Yeah. I'm sure, 
you know, and I'm not talking shit here at all. Like I love all the people I've talked to, but I'm sure if you hired Kenny, Kenny Aronoff and you told him to do the hunt sales thing, cause he has a million other things in his tool belt. I'd, I would get hunt sales to do the hunt sales thing, you know? So I'm, of course, all these people in, the, in these bands, you know, even the, the, when I first got introduced to the new Axel version of Guns N' Roses, the Bumblefoot and, Mm-hmm. And and Ashba and so they all probably had a certain superpower which got them in that band that they did something really really well better than anyone else and that's kind of why they were compiled and that's how you were probably brought in because something caught Slash's ears or or however that happened that you do something like so confidently or so supremely that it really fit and it really brought the band to another level so stop talking bad about yourself <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's it's maybe it's a Canadian thing you know it's a it's a sort of constant. I remember when I was a kid, my father would say, if someone gives you a compliment, just say thank you. You don't mm-hmm. need to elaborate. You don't need to be kind of like, um, you don't need to be, because one of the things that I, I, I have learned to, to not do is the, you guys were great tonight. And then you, you immediately want to kind of like go, well, you know, my guitar cable went out or, you know, you, you, you kind of like, it was a weird night for me. And I've learned that the person who's complimenting you or the person who enjoyed the show, they really don't want to hear your weird, you know, report card <laughs> that you yeah. made for. Sounded and good to me. That that, yes. Yeah. It's like, I, and so I've kind of learned to just kind of go, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Cause it's like, you know, you know how it is when you're on stage, it's, it's, it's like going to war sometimes where it's like the monitor went down or this or whatever. And you're kind of like, it just sort of, you got to go out there and do your best. And I'm yeah. not the kind of guy who sits there drawing all kinds of attention to all the problems that are happening. I'm kind of like, these people paid to be here and I'm going to give them the best show I can. It's not really about what my personal, it, it, in a funny way, it's not really about me anymore. Once you brought people into the room, it's about them. No one has any idea out in that Argentina crowd that we played that the monitors were blaring my head off so fucking loud i could barely <laughs> sit on the drum throne all they needed to know was that i'm sitting there and playing normally as i yelled to the sound guys to the left and the right in between each song what the fuck is going on like, yeah that's the worst fucking shaking my skull they don't care they don't know you got to play it perfect well, that is the worst <laughs> i know and it's it's one of those things where you 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 know, you, you have to do your best. And, and you're, if you're a chef or something like that, you're only as good as your, you know, to, your utensils, you gotta have the knife and I gotta have the thing. If you go out there and you don't have any of those things then you're improvising beyond control. And, you know, we've, we've all been through, you know, in situations where we have to improvise and you've broken a snare drum head or, or a cymbals cracked or whatever that's in drummer world. It's, it's nonstop sticks. And, you know, it's like, there's so many <laughs> different factors that can go sideways on you that, um, but that's just the nature of the game. It's like, it, there's really the chances of it being an A plus show as far as nothing ever going wrong. It's, that's just the nature of it. You know, it's like, and then you look at the shows that have even more stuff, teleprompters and pyro and all that. It's like, then you're asking for even more stuff to go wrong, you know? And, and it does, it's just the nature of the spinal tap. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was a, S- you know, the SWU, I don't know if they have it anymore, that festival, uh, ah, okay. Chile, San Diego. Mm-hmm. Uh, a few years back so like the night before the show I, i'd sprain my wrist or whatever i'm always doing some kind of injury because i overexcite myself but anyway i had this huge like wrap around my left arm when we went out on stage and in the middle of the set it came unraveled and it wrapped around both arms and i'm oh, <laughs> and like tied my arms and, and rouse saw it and he like ran over and like perfect like didn't even break a stride he's like trying to unwrap it while he's playing at the same time Oh so my this God! Can't be happening right now. But you know, I guess if you were to look at the YouTube version of the song or something, you really don't notice. Really, there's kind of a skirmish in the background, but it's like that kind of nightmare scenario. Oh no! Just trying to kind of fight through, and I'm sure you've had, you know, unplugging cords or or people kind uh, of yeah, mess with pedals. I've fallen on stage a number of times, torn my pants. It's all part of it. When you do this enough times, eventually you're going to have everything everything that can happen. You know, going on stage with a major fever, you know, all that yeah. stuff. It sucks. You know, it's just part of the part of the deal. When you were woodshedding uh, in growing up in Canada, Saskatoon? Outside of Saskatoon, mm. but close. Yeah, there's this 70 miles east of Saskatoon, a little town called Atlantic. So we didn't have like 7-Elevens or McDonald's or streetlights. It was just a little town. Yeah, 1,500 people. 
hockey was God, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's actually, I think there's a song in Slapshot about Saskatoon. That's how, yeah. that's how it runs. A little bit song. south of Saskatoon. <laughs> that's the one, yeah. <laughs> um, was it, did you have a little scene or was it like me, even though I grew up in Orange County, you know, I spoke the other day, I, I was talking to Zach Alford and, you know, that tied me into your Richard Fortas interview about Charlie Drayton because me and Zach were talking about Charlie Drayton, how oh, wow. it was so competitive and so much yet supportive in New York, even uh, just in their Upper West Side, so much talent. Me, everyone was surfing and in, had an interest. It was pulling teeth to drive everywhere just to get people to jam. You know, I'd I bet. yank surfboards out of their arms just to get in the garage with me and jam. Did you have a little scene or did how, can you give me like a little micro bio leading yourself out of Canada into like kind of the move, the, the first part of your pro professional career? It's it's fascinating to me because it seems like a very uniquely Canadian thing because uh, a lot of my friends started in a similar um, like when we were kids we would play at high school dances and I don't it, it seemed to be a normal thing a normal circuit to some degree <laughs> to go out and play other towns playing like you know cover songs like you know summer sixty nine all that kind of stuff you know just and. Uh, you know, we're like, like 14, 15 years old. And the, I mean, the guys in the band were always like five years older than me at least. So, and I would, we would just go out to these towns every weekend. And that was sort of my, sort of my job, you know, rather than packing groceries every weekend, I was going out and doing that. And, you know, I, I made a few bucks, you know, doing it and whatnot. And then when, when I was old, you know, when I was, uh, once we kind of like finished high school, then it was like, then there's a whole circuit in Canada where you could go and play, um, Monday to Saturday in whatever town and you would go and load in on, on, on the Sunday and set up or the Monday, depending on when you got there and you would play like three sets a night all week. And it was such a, like, it's a bizarre thing to consider now, but there was a million bands. You know I mean? Like we were all, uh, and everybody was just crossing all cover kind of all cover stuff. Um, and I sort of, I was still very young playing with other bands, and uh, it really helped me as far as becoming really comfortable on stage. You know what I mean? Like it was kind of like I was always on stage. Three sets a night was basically playing three shows a night for, you know, six nights a week. So, so and with became, all those cover it, songs, you're genre crossing constantly. Yeah, exactly. And the yeah. other thing, and the other thing about learning uh, cover songs was you really do learn a lot about songwriting because you're kind of like constantly, you know, it's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you know, like you have this sort of like, uh, blueprints of every different song put in front of you. Some are different, some are, you know, all, uh, they're all have their own thing, but you really do learn a lot from that. Um, and I eventually put my own band together uh, and I was playing bass back then. As I mentioned, I was a bass player, uh, singer, and then my put, I put a band together with my brother, but my brother had started playing bass, so I moved out front with a rhythm guitar, like Duff Dead did in Loaded. And um, it was myself and my brother and then two other brothers from our, our little corner of the world. And we got a record deal. You know, I mean, we, we did the circuit. We played our asses off. We started in that same circuit of playing cover songs, but we were writing all the time and adding our own thing and building a following. And um, We eventually got signed to Mercury out of New York, which was totally bizarre because we're like from, you know, like middle of nowhere, Canada. And uh, so we would, you know, we got a deal with Mercury out of New York. That's Tears for Fears. Uh, we, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we, we recorded an album. Um, and in classic record, you know, record industry form, the president of the company was either fired or changed. Mm -hmm. Danny Goldberg stepped in and it's that classic, like, you know, cleaning of the slate. So bands like us, we were just completely cut loose, but we released our album. We recorded the album on their dime and just released it in Canada because we had uh, Canada kind of kept as an independent clause for ourselves because we had kind of built an entire indie scene for ourselves and that sort of turned into uh you know that kind of worked out well for us you know gold records and we were doing a lot of you know new york a lot of la and you know, a lot of showcasing type stuff so that was like largely when i put my started to get my feet into the states mm -hmm. um you know then i then i started recording bands at one point i had my own solo thing going on you know it, it kind of went on like that for a while till the canadian scene because as you know the record industry was such that uh once the downloading thing happened it crushed 
the you know the it crushed the industry essentially. So the Canadian industry, like I'm talking about, like it's one thing. It was one thing for you could have a career in Canada, like you could be a band and, and release records in Canada back then. Mm. But I think once bands like Nickelback and a few bands like that started to come along and became internationally uh, successful, it became like it wasn't as as sort of like it didn't make as much sense just being a band that played across Canada a hundred times a year. You know? um, and it just became like, you know, people weren't buying records. So Canada is exponentially that much smaller of a market than, than the United States. So it was just, you know, it kind of was like this, this sort of like lost cause. And I, and that's what when was, the States what was kinda, the band at this, at this point, what was the, that was the band? age of electric. The okay. age of electric was a band from Saskatchewan that we eventually moved to Vancouver we recorded with Bob Rock, you know, Molly yeah. Crew, oh, yeah. Metallica, and all that. Um, it's a little more we, alt we, rock, we, wasn't it? How would you? How it was way, you... it was way more '90s yeah. alt rock. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were, you know, we, we grew up like everybody else with long hair and, you know, loved the Cult and you know all yeah. those bands. And um, but as the '90s sort of started, to, you know, to to take shape, we had already kind of like, you know, we were young enough that it sort of like, it, it had kind of like, uh, really presented itself that way, you know, to kind of be like uh alt rock was just kind of like what we were into so um so in coming to the states it was a lot more like you know you know i was going through a breakup and my friends like come to vegas man there's all kinds of things to do here so i, I literally was just coming down it was october of 2006 so i was coming down to play a, a halloween show with my friends and then you know i'll stick around till christmas and i'll go back and then and then another gig came up and that got me my visa and another gig came up and then like Brent Muscat from Faster Pussycat said, let's go to Europe. We're going to do this Faster Pussycat reunion thing. And I was like, OK, cool. I, I hadn't been to Europe at that point, considering I've been there a thousand times now. But, um, you know, so the whole thing just kind of like kept steamrolling into these opportunities. And then Brent Muscat and I put together a band here. We called it the Sin City Sinners and just had a residency. And it was just literally jamming fun. Uh, and we'd have like George Lynch is here or Slim Jim Phantom or. Sylvain Sylvain from the New York Dolls or, you know, whoever would just come play with us. And then uh, and then the slash call came. And that was when, you know, everything changed after that. Well, Ellefson was in Sin City Sinners, wasn't he? He sat in with us. Oh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. 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 So it was right Almost anybody you can imagine pretty much sat in with us. <laughs> anybody who came through Vegas came and, came and jumped on stage with us. I think much. every big city kind of has one of those bands. Yeah. Well, your, your buddy, uh, uh, Matt Starr, had something yeah. that... Uh, in Hollywood there for a while. I think I jumped on something a long time ago back in the day. Yeah, they they do a thing over at the uh, at the whiskey and at the uh, at the uh, the bowling place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lucky, lucky, strike. lucky strike. Lucky strike. That's it. Yeah. I taught uh, as music director at the local school of rock here for a few years, and I used to book a bunch of stuff at Lucky Strike. And the kids had a blast doing that. Um, so you you were brought in at the end of that. You were brought in um, with your drummer and another guitar player you brought in by yourself into the slash thing how did that communication that first communication happen um well it was i built enough of a life for myself in vegas that i bought a house this house yeah <laughs> and uh but the funniest thing about it is i think i spent seven days in it before i went around the world for a year and a half with slash so um it was like you know like I said, I've been jamming with all these guys, you know, like jamming with all these, like, you know, basically heroes of mine. I, it's never lost on me when Dave, Dave Ellison comes to town. I'm like, dude, I watched Headbangers Ball and all, you know, I like all those guys. It's like, I, I still get, it's hard for me to detach from that, that yeah. thing, you know? So when I'm sitting there and Brent Fitz calls, Brent Fitz, the drummer for, for the Slash uh, yeah. camp, he goes, he had gotten the gig. He'd gotten the gig with Slash. Like, oh, cool. That's so great. I didn't really ever think can i be in there i was just sort of like that's awesome you got the gig great um then he goes like come down to hollywood tomorrow and jam with us or north hollywood i guess and i was like okay you know it was like it just sort of like i'd been like you know come over here and jam come over there and jam we're gonna jam yeah, with yeah. slim jim tonight you know whatever that's what that upright bass is there for for me to jam with slim jim phantom and you know so i was like i was like yeah okay cool so i, I drove down there and i don't know it was just so fascinating because my father came with me. That was the other side of it too. Because my father was here. We were, I was looking for a house and he's a grown up, and I'm not, and I, I like to have a consigliere to kind of, you know, help me kind of figure that out. Yeah. And I just kind of looked at him, I go, you, you ever, you want to go to LA tomorrow? And he was kind of like, well, I've never been to LA. I go, well, there's reason enough to go to LA. So, <laughs> so we drove out in the morning and I jammed, I like, a, I think I, I, I literally jammed like night train 
I don't remember jamming more than that. I, yeah. I probably might have been one or two more. And then it was kind of like, okay, we're doing Jay Leno next week. And it just like was like this, <laughs> I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Meanwhile, I had a million gigs in Vegas. I had a regular, so it was very difficult and a, and a bit sort of, it was tough to kind of like, okay, well, do I take this on? At the time, I was never sure if that was, if that was going to be, you know, three months of flyouts on weekends, doing casinos and, you know, just kind of like supporting this record. And then it would be high five game over. That yeah. was fun. You know, that was 11 years ago this month. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's how weird it is that that went on for a year and a half around the world. And then slash said, I think we're, we're going to do the new record with the band. And I go like us. And he goes, yeah, I go, okay. So then it was like, we made a record and went around the world again, you know, and that's been going on and off for 11 years you know wow. so it's like the conspirators started in 2012 like we added frank on guitar it became the unit it is now yeah. so that's that's nine years ago so that's it's really twisted to think about how how much how long we've been doing this and i know we always stop and go well this is longer than velvet revolver lasted you know it's like it's it's a weird thing to consider i know we take tons of breaks for alter bridge or guns and roses and stuff yeah. that we're all doing it and, and that's kind of uh but it's you know it's 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 we enjoy each other's uh, company musically and otherwise that's important. Cool gig. I mean, you deserve it. Like people say, I've run into people you know coming off stage before. It's like, how did you get this gig, man? You know, it's like <laughs> I always have the respect for people with with uh, with your kind of background, this lengthy background you've been up through all sorts of genres. You've been in a van. You've killed yourself doing this. You know, it's not like you just got pulled out of nowhere and you're all of a sudden on stage doing this, you know, there's a, there's a, everyone has a backstory, you know? So I, I was, I always think about it. Like if anyone has that kind of attitude, like how did you get this gig? You know, it's like, I understand that I know how you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, but, and, uh, you know, and it sounds weird. I don't even know you. I, I met you guys like briefly in the lobby or something. And, and, yeah. And, uh, yeah Ralph and Squires know you much more but um uh what was i where was i going with this well that's the funniest thing about like you can be on the road with another band and never see them you know what i mean like it's like we, we've toured with a lot of bands and been like in passing like hey dude you know and that's sort of the brunt of but yeah we you know because of duff's close relation in this is this is pre-guns and roses you yeah. know uh, guns and roses um not in this lifetime reunion stuff I heard all so, the phone calls. Nope. Yeah, I no, bet. it's not enough. It's not enough money. It's not enough money. <laughs> heard them all. How do you like that, right? <laughs> Bad. Well, Duff's sort of the uh, mastermind of that kind of stuff. You know, he's mm. sort of a, a genius in that. So yeah, it was it was an interesting place to be, like to where we were in our camp and you guys were in your camp and watching this thing kind of this you know monolithic thing sort of take off was like so cool, and you know a lot of people were like, dude, that's such a drag for you, and I'm like, I, I honestly I thought it was an amazing vantage point to watch this thing kind of, you know, come back together was just like, wow, this is so cool. And yeah. I'm the kind of guy, I, I've always got a hundred other things going on. You know, like even now I've got, you know, once this is done, like we're going in, we're trying to get some stuff together and I got other projects just kind of hovering there waiting for me to be available to do that. So um, I've just always been pretty, you know, kind of gung ho about just doing stuff. It's like, I, in more recent years, especially since COVID happened, I'm very aware of how little time or not, not really how little time I have left, but more a case of like how quickly time goes. The fact that it's 11 years ago that we started playing together and I've, I've released quite a bit of my own material and other projects and stuff like that in, in the course of that. Um, but it definitely makes me feel like, uh, I don't know, you know, cause I don't know if, if, uh, if I'm going to be able to do this like Paul McCartney or Mick Jagger, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if he's 75 years old and still playing music is in my cards. You know, I, I sure hope so. Um, but you just don't know because, uh, uh, so I kind of feel like I just want to do everything I can while I can, you know, cause it, it, eventually it's, I don't know, arthritis or, uh, just. Well, you're only going to meet more knees. people. Yeah, I, I think I took one music lesson like when I was ten or something. I just the one thing I remember from this conductor was like he puts up on the chalkboard behind him, and he was a classical teacher. And he was like um, talent, equipment, sweat, 
blah, blah, blah. And at the end, he puts people. And he's like, because he talks to the whole class. And he's like, what's the most important thing? Put them in order. <laughs> Interesting. And I can tell this is a bitter. He was, he was like in his 70s or something. And he circled people. And he put them up once, you know. He put it up at number one, just like, you know, make the connections. Yes, of course, practice. Yes, natural talent is very important. But having a good attitude and, and meeting people and going from one gig to the next, if you want to have that kind of career, is super important. And that's when I teach as young as like six years old here and it goes up to like 50 or whatever. But anyone who's like, if there is going to be another music uh if music happens ever again, you know, and and there's a drummer or musician who's like, I want to, I want to be in a band and tour. I always try to coach that, you know, have a good attitude. Thing, Absolutely, you know, I, <laughs> you know it's, it's like I was saying earlier. It's like, um, it's always the guy who's a good hang who will get the gig, who will keep the gig. More importantly, because a lot of great yeah. players get gigs, but they're like, like you say, he's that that guy's a handful. He's got an ego. He's difficult. There's drugs, there's alcohol, there's any yeah. number of things that, that can be a problem. And, and the guy who can hang and you can actually sit in a van with or on an air, airplane ride or on a bus yeah. for multiple hours and for you know months at a time, that's the guy you want to be with. You know what I mean? That's that's really how it comes down to. It doesn't mean you can just like not be a good musician. You have to be you have to really kill yourself to be as good as you can be as well. Um, but you have to be a good dude. Period. Yeah. I met uh so uh Rouse and Squires were in, in the Seattle scene were in separate things. I knew it, we all knew of each other and I was in a different thing called uh, Vendetta Red, which is more like Screamo. There was a Screamo thing, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Early really aughts or whatever, all, all that mm -hmm. stuff. Warp Tour stuff and Taste of Chaos. and So Loaded just got done recording with Terry Date and uh, down at Bad Animals and I remember Squires visiting while we were recording. Um, this was a Vendetta Red record, and they needed a drummer to go out. Or it was a uh, halftime for the Seahawks game. <laughs> wow! Hey, cool. are you available this weekend? So uh, I did that. We did like one rehearsal. We did that. It was New York Giants versus Seahawks. Cool. We did, we did a couple songs. So I just got to know the camp then. But and it, I wasn't in the band then. Uh, there was some, a little bit of time had passed, but then there's like a Motorhead thing that came a few months later in like an extended tour through the UK and um, South America and stuff like that. And that's kind of when I was in. Um, but it was cool to get to like know Duff a, a little bit during those rehearsals and how to, how to lock up and, and understand every band works differently and every band's leader works yeah. differently. And that's you get true. little you get little cues, you know. Like yeah, he would be like, "Is that the fill you're gonna do?" <laughs> that that's the, gonna be the one. Yep, he's like, "Just want to make sure." You know, <laughs> he wasn't totally a whip cracker. Like, and of course, like I've heard you talk about when you rehearse with your drummer and you want it, and before the singers come in and you want everything, you're like black belt. You're like you're good to go. You want everything right. ironed out, and I would work all that the classic stuff out because we do all the Guns N' Roses covers, you know. I'd work that out. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, the Steven thing. Yeah. It's the, it, it was the, it was the moments where I got my freedom to do stuff where we were checking in on each other, you know, like, of course, he's all good yeah. with it. He comes from a punk background. He's all good with a little bit of freedom. He just wants to make sure that he knows where he's at, you know? So he's been like the coolest, you know, big brother I never had. He's hilarious. He really yeah. is. And he really he's has a life. magical, uh, a magical feel that doesn't really, um, you know, we all replicate that stuff. You know what I mean? Like we all play it and we, we, we really try to make sure we're doing it faithfully, but there's been times where Steven will be at rehearsal and just sit down and play Mr. Brownstone. And it's just like, that's, that's it. <laughs> I don't know what's, there's nothing necessarily missing from how anybody else is playing it, but it's just kind of yeah. like, whatever it is, he has brought the secret sauce. That's just sort of there. You know what I mean? It's a Steven swing. Yeah. He's got, he's got a swing to him. Give me two seconds. I'm just going to reply to my wife. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she's like, waiting for a uber apologies no here we go hey where did the where did the damn it coming from sorry i'm such a rookie in your life story no it's actually <laughs> it's always fun to tell it because it's it's just one of those things that um uh you know it's one of those nicknames rhymes with god damn it and uh the old punk rock johnny rotten and sid vicious and uh, in vancouver there was a whole scene of doa and all those bands where they you know would take 
their first name and then add some kind of wacky thing, you know, like just give you a, a, a punk rock last name. And mm-hmm. that's one of those ones that just sort of was there and it was just kind of a gag. Toddzilla, all those kind of things. And then Todd Dammon was just a, a funny thing. So when I came down to Vegas, and this is the, a part of the interesting thing about, about changing my entire environment was the fact that back in Canada, I was that guy from that thing. And, you know, it was the, um, you know, I'd, I'd done all this stuff and, and, you know, there's a lot of baggage you carry along with you, you know, not, not necessarily bad baggage. It's just sort of like people know you, they know what you do, your, their expectations are there. But when I came to down here, it was like, no one knew who Todd was, you know, no one knew who I was. It was like just some Todd guy. So on stage, I would just call myself Todd damn it as a, as a joke. And then, um, and then, uh, you just stuck. It was actually Vinnie Paul from, uh, Pantera. Yeah. Hell yeah. He was really big on calling me that I would scream it across casinos and be like, Oh, there he is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just kind of caught on. And then literally like a, t- a t-shirt, uh, a friend of mine made a, a damn it t-shirt for me for bir- my birthday. And we shot a video in Stoke on Trent, um, in England where slash was sort of from, we shot a concert DVD there and I wore that shirt. And people were like, where can I get that shirt? I go, well, this is the only shirt, you know? Um, so eventually it was like, I don't know, just do a run of knockouts of shirts and just sell them, I guess. And then, you know, and then it sort of grew and grew. And then a company from Toronto got involved. And um, I'm picturing like a stuff. producer. Cause I, I, I always think there's three levels of fame, right? There's like, who's Todd Kearns. And then there's like, get me Todd Kearns. And then there's get me <laughs> someone like Todd Kearns. So I'm picturing, <laughs> A producer going, get me Todd Kearns, damn it. It's an order. We need him now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's one of those things that just kind of like, and then Slash started calling me that on stage. But um, Todd, damn it, Kearns. And it just sort of like, it just sort of sticks. Um, It's funny because I'm not really, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm such a like, you know, a creature of quote unquote authenticity. I like to be just kind of like, just a guy playing rock and roll. I'm not, I don't really care about all the star stuff. I, I don't really, I don't really, you know, I've got a car, I've got a house. I don't need yeah. five of them. I don't need, you know, more. I don't need bigger. I don't need, yeah. I'm perfectly content and happy with what I have. So, um, but I mean, you know, with that and with opportunity, it changes your, your entire world, you know, guys like slash and duff, when you fall into that world, it just, the whole game is different, you know? So, mm-hmm. But I, I've always liked the blue collar musician. You know, I, I put my hard hat on and go to work. You know, I really enjoy, I really enjoy making music and playing music with other guys, like minded guys, guys that I like hanging out with and playing with, and and uh, continue till 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 I can't anymore. So talking about your hard work back, if you can go back to when you're a kid, and I'm sure you had uh, a collective of friends, you know, and you all rock together, guitar, bass, you were in bands. What were the, what was the record, one or two or three records that kind of t- took you? I think there's always a period where someone decides that's what they want to do for a living. I grew up in a surfer community and there was mm-hmm. jocks and other beach, beach stuff, but I was not social. I spent a lot of time by myself learning Exit Stage Left learning Spring right. Session M, learning uh, the three colored records by King Crimson, spending a lot of time by myself. And then I come back to school the next year and the drummer friends that I had were like, whoa, what the fuck happened? I didn't right, make, right. make me want to quit or whatever. So what do you think were like a couple of records that like took you to another level where you kind of made a gap there between your musical friends? Well, it's so funny because, you know, hearing you talk about it, it's like it, I never got bit by that sort of like um, – I was always so much about songs and so much about writing that the first bands I put together, we, we never really learned songs at all. We just sort of wrote made up stuff. You know what I mean? It was like, so th- the funny thing is it's like, I and mean, we were putting bands together when we could barely play, you know what I mean? It's a kind of like somebody knows three chords just bash you know, it out. One, <laughs> and just bash it out and sort of like, um, you know, and then it'd be like that guy, he's better than us. And then all of a sudden you keep playing and suddenly you're better than him just because you are slightly more passionate about it. I never really had that sort of, um, we're going to sit down and learn crazy like uh, chops and proggy mm-hmm. type stuff. I was never that kind of guitar player. I always just loved straight up just, you know, I wanted to live on the Malcolm Young, you know, mm-hmm. I, all my guitars are like 
brand or like just beat to hell for like seven frets and then brand new to the end <laughs> and then <laughs> till up around the 21st fret or whatever yeah. um and and the same with the bass playing i was I, i'm kind of like you know duff and i talk about it a lot we come from a very similar school of like where the bass is is an accompanying instrument it's not necessarily meant to be a solo instrument per se um although there's all kinds of lines that you do that are are very you know important within the framework of the song but yeah, I just I wouldn't I never really got bit by that bug. So for me, it's like you know it, it's it's funny to talk about King Crimson and then go like, well, the first Ramones album that was a big one, <laughs> you know, and then like Kiss Alive, you know, things like that. We we just love playing rock and roll. So although we you know of course when the '80s started to happen, um, of course it was happening. You know, bands like Van Halen, there's Ed's guitar, one of them there. Um, you know, that was just never my thing. I, I kind of went like when, like when I was talking about the, the Beatles and Kiss earlier, like just seeming like I can't do that. Those guys are from outer space. I felt the exact same way about Eddie Van Halen. I was like, well, I can't do that. That guy's yeah. he's an alien. You know, um, but of course, I had a lot of friends who were like, you know, you know, woodshedding in their basement. So I just felt like my my lane was this and those guys do that. You know, So yeah. um, my, my, my you know, as a vocalist, um, which is a weird thing to talk about because you I sound never trained. took lessons. It, people say that, and I, I'm not trained at all. Mm. Uh, it's, but it is literally years and years and years of just singing and playing on stage. And mm. and a big a big leg up was Vegas. Coming to Vegas put me back in the game uh, where I had been living for ten plus years, just making my own music, and you know, singing with w what's comfortable to me to sing. And it was alternative. You got to remember the alternative '90s weren't about like big screaming yeah. vocals anymore i mean there was hiding was behind a wall of guitars yeah. no it was it was a different world and it was yeah. um suddenly you know cobain and corgan and those kind of guys that became kind of the norm um but i could always kind of sing that kind of stuff uh, when i came to vegas it became a lot more like opening that side of myself back up you know what i mean and then playing with miles uh and recording with the slash guys it became you know i was never hired as like the the second vocalist or the harmony guy it was just sort of like well i can sing the harmonies from all these recordings and i just did you know so you and then pull we that out with, of your pocket bonus it, points man yeah it was just sort of like weird and now it's it's very normal like slash looks at me when we're working on something he goes because miles will be seeing this he goes can you sing the you know because slash doesn't really talk in like thirds or fifths he goes like can you sing the higher part here and I'm like, yeah of course you know or I'll, I'll try you know it's like um but you know miles is no joke he's like you know a very very uh gifted vocalist and can like really hit it and then i'm like i have to sing the third above that now oh okay <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah michael so anthony it, stuff exactly <laughs> of which you know of which he doesn't get nearly enough credit because yeah you know in analyzing van halen it's like it's it's really impressive what he's been doing and running around and, and running around <laughs> with a Jack Daniels base. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, you get this, uh, I wanted to talk about auditioning a little bit and I don't, I don't know your whole history, but you're, you're at a, you're at a really cool spot now, but I'm curious cause you talk about <clears throat> the graph of a rock musician's career and I've had gigantic peaks and dips. Like there, there's mm -hmm. nothing close to a straight line. You know, I've mm -hmm. auditioned uh, Offspring, I've auditioned for Pumpkins, I've auditioned for Billy Howardell, and, you know, but I get the Duff thing, or I get the, you know, whatever, or Blue Man Group, or yeah. blah, 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 blah. So I'm, I'm curious, you don't even have to name any names, but were, were there some valleys where you're like, man, I really wanted that thing that you have um, audition? It's weird, because I didn't really do the audition thing very much, and I also yeah. don't think I'm very good at the audition thing. I think I'm one of those guys that it's like, um, well, I say that only because I've only done a few and going into them, it was sort of like, um, it was sort of like the, the decision had been kind of made before I even got there, but they're, you know, how it is when they, it's like they've cast a, a movie or something like that, but they want to look at other people anyway. We've already got Denzel, but we got to you know, look at some other people. Um, so, you know, it's always, uh, I don't really, I'm one of those guys, I don't spend a lot of time looking back. I don't have a lot of those kind of like, ah, if I'd only gotten that one gig, I don't really feel that way. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like everything is sort of gravy and everything's been kind of like, I've been, I feel very fortunate to be able to do any of it and continue to do it. Um, uh, you know, I, I suppose because I've been, I've also been a part of auditioning people, you know what I mean? Like even in the slash band, we've had to audition 
a guitar player or whatever. And, mm. and it's such a painful process, you know, yeah. watching guys come in and like, you know, and you just kind of know He's they're shaking. not like, <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, bro, just plug in, let's jam. You know, it's like yeah. no big deal, but you know, but to, 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 to them, it's, it's a major opportunity. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, ultimately I, I'm not really, I don't really worry too much about any of that. I just kind of feel like, you know, like you, you kind of go, uh, I've, I've, I've tried out in a couple of singing positions that were kind of interesting, but again, it was like, I, I often, even if with those things, I was, I kind of would do them with a very sort of like, well, I'm, I'm doing it, but I don't really, I don't really care. You know, not, not that I don't yeah. care, but it's kind of like, I, I wasn't really like dying for the gig. I was like, I'll try it, you know, see how it goes. And, and I always been sort of like have the attitude, like if it doesn't work out, then it wasn't meant to be. And I just kind of move on. doesn't mean it doesn't suck sometimes when you're like, ah, you know, that would have been nice or the paycheck would have been nice or whatever it was. Yeah. But yeah. That's why I relate to that movie. Uh, the Metallica doc was a yeah. monster at that base session. Cause it's, it is um, really, uh, uh, it, it is heavy and it's, it's nerve wracking, like going into like, when you're walking into a gigantic studio and all the amps are humming and all, and all the management's looking at you and the lights are up and people are taking video. But it's like, I didn't get this one thing, but the offspring manager dropped my name into the pumpkins hat, even though I mm -hmm. got down to the final two or whatever. And then the pumpkins guy dropped it into this other hat. So you get in, you get close enough to where like people remember you. So it could be worth it even expanding, you know, your circle of contacts, you know, even though the disappointment is, you know, yeah, you're exactly right. It, 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 it's all based on like, you know, in, in this business, so much of it is word of mouth. Yeah. Usually when, you know, the first thing is when someone asks you, we need a drummer, who do you know? You know, it's usually like, you know, you just sort of name a couple guys that you like and that's it. I mean, the audition, yeah. the like open casting uh, audition thing is awful. I would rather just ask my friends, do you know any good drummers? You know, like who, who's good? You know, okay, let's, let's try him. Yeah. As opposed to just like an open you know, go to mates and have like a million guys come down. It's painful. Plus, it's like I learned the whole catalog, the Pumpkins catalog, and the manager just says, hey, just have fun. I show up and it's he's, <laughs> he's, he's on keys and Jeff is on guitar and that's it. Right. We're doing it. Three, and we're not even we're just jamming on Britpop shoegazer stuff for like half an hour. And then we eat sushi and we talk. For that a sounds like, like Jeff. I don't yeah. even know what's going on right now. Maybe it was about the hang, I guess. I was all, yeah, yeah, maybe. It's, uh, we talk, yeah. I guess Howardell used to be uh, a Pumpkins guitar tech. and, and he did, That's they right. They don't have good blood, so like he sabotaged one of his amps during a show or something. Something weird happened there in the conversation. Um, anyway, the last Crazy. thing, so like what this channel is all about, like healthier life, you know, maintaining your, your career as a, as a touring musician. And I'm just curious, like in your whole uh, career span, did you ever have to come back from any kind of tweaks in your, in your arms or, or your hands? Um, and you had to like get into a better routine about maintaining your health, you know, to continue the tour or, or being in the studio supplements, anything like that? You know, it's funny because I've always been not much of a drinker and in the last, you know, 15 years you know i haven't drank at all i've been sober Good um you. yeah so that side of things i was always fine with mm -hmm. um but uh you know around 2012 2013 around the apocalyptic oh no yeah apocalyptic love was the record we were making at that time um i came off the road and it was just like my, my friend said to me he said you're in a constant state of jet lag i go well that's the best explanation for what i'm going through i was just constantly out of it like i just felt like you know, I'd been around the world a hundred times and just got spit out. And I remember I came to Vegas and I jumped on stage with my friends. And the next day I, 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 I blew out my knees. I, I had plantar fasciitis mm. and all these things going wrong with me. And they kind of all came down at once, like a, a neck problem and a back problem. And, uh, and I, I, it's weird to look back on it now because it seems so like, you know, like, like life altering, you know, like I was like, constantly exhausted had all these problems um and i got into uh yoga and stretching and meditating of which i'm really terrible at maintaining a practice yeah. i've always been really bad at like you know I, I when i say practice i mean like a regular practice i do it but i don't do it the way a person should do it mm -hmm. um as a friend of mine pointed out once he goes well it's because you start feeling better 
that you start veering away from the things that made you feel better because you don't you feel like mentally you don't have to do it anymore because you um you feel better so so when it does flare up again you know and it you know, I, I had to go get like uh, a lot of it was very, very confusing, which I find interesting in Western medicine. When you'd go and you'd be like, this is the problem I'm dealing with. I go to sports guys and they were like, I don't know. And it wasn't <laughs> until one day, you know, a, a guy gave me like some or this lady get, got me some uh, some great inserts in my shoes and it straightened out my whole system. I'm not I'm yeah. a tall guy and I've always had like really heavy guitars on. I got I got suited for a, uh, a friend's wedding once and my shoulders are like this. And the guy goes, you got some kind of sports injury or something? And I go, no, it was like a thousand years of carrying a heavy guitar or a heavy bass my whole yeah. life, you know? Um, so there's all those kind of like, you know, I'm getting older. My, my I, I definitely have arthritis coming on and that's sort of like an ongoing. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm one of those guys that kind of refuses to let it sort of to uh, kind of get me. You know what I mean? Like I got to kind of figure out the way around it. Well, you know, it's like people had to deal with this before. How do the what's the what's the angle here? You know, I had a, uh, in 2010, I had just joined Slash's band and somewhere within, within the six months of the band, I had a, a detached retina that sent me back. Like I had to come home for two months and we had a replacement guy out doing a whole Asian leg. Um, so I've, you know, I've been through the ringer a few times, but Jeez. you know, that's life. That's life in a sense, you know, it's like, you know, you're, uh, and I just feel like, you know, this whole COVID thing has been really terrible for me because I am the guy who needs no excuse to stay home. I love mm. being home. I love watching television, spending time with my family and, you know, just being locked down. Like it's like I it's my favorite thing because because my world is usually the exact opposite. So that when I come home, it's just like complete shutdown, you know, so I don't need to be convinced to shut down. But. So are you, worried, on. are you one of the ones who are worried about when they loosen the rules up a little bit? Like, oh, no, I like staying in. Don't loosen <laughs> up the rules. <laughs> I, I, not really. I'm actually kind of uh, – I'm pretty good at adapting. I, I do yeah. know that about myself. I'm pretty good at like – socially, I'm pretty good. Like I, I – you know, with the guys, it's kind of like I'm able to kind of like turn it on and turn it off. And I'm just a big, a big believer in downtime. Like, you know, because my life is so – my life is so on all the time yeah. that when it's off, it's off, you know. And, uh, you know, it was different when I was younger, when you're younger, you're just, I'm missing something. And you yeah. realize later on, you're not missing anything. You know, you're like, it's, you know, like when I was younger, I remember saying to an older guy, he was probably in his fifties studio guy. I remember going, we're going out. We're going to go do this. We're going to go to that club. We're going to do that. There's this band's playing over there. And he just looked at me, he goes, he goes, ah, I've been out. Yeah. And I go, and I remember like <laughs> thinking like, what? Like just, and now I'm like, I, I, I hear those words and I go, there's nothing that you're going to do tonight that I haven't done a million times. So it's kind of like, yeah, good point. You know, now I kind of feel like, although I live in Las Vegas and there's always something to do and always a new, you know, show to go see in a restaurant. Da, da, da. Um, I just have always been sort of, uh, but when I say a homebody, it's mostly I'm a homebody based on the idea that, um, that the, you know, the, I'm not home you know, most of the time, except for the last year. Um, and even that's starting to kind of like loosen up. So we'll see. That's funny. Cause my wife is a, she's an audio engineer specialist. She's doing the new hockey rink here in Seattle, but oh, wow. she's also a singer songwriter drummer. And she's always like, nah, I don't need to, I've been, I've done that. I've been out. Don't need to go anywhere. <laughs> you know, a Sopranos, you know, the, we'll, we'll redo, uh, we'll redo all the Netflix stuff. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, I know. Um, I'm really jealous of your. Is that a single or a double cutaway junior special behind you? That one? The that's a double. One. Is it? Yeah. It's a double. Yeah, yeah. They're really cool. They're really dorky on me. They're my favorite guitar, but because I'm so tall, they look like a. My friend's always like, looks like a ukulele on me. I'm like. <laughs> this was rad, man. I'm really appreciate, uh, appreciate you taking the time to help out the old channel here, pump some people 100%, up. 100% my pleasure. Positive I, uh, energy. I really enjoy it. It was really fun. Well, keep in touch, my friend. It would be great to, uh, hopefully we'll be up in that area. Uh, I don't know. No one knows anything. No one's got a crystal ball. I did the, I did the, um, vaccination yesterday. You did. Um, yeah. Through my wife's, uh, association. Uh, but, uh, so that's a good step. So we'll see what comes after that. You know, from then it's sort of like, I'm starting to see like people who've had the, uh, 
vaccination can get together without masks now. I'm like, okay, whatever. I so can't we'll wait to get into that stadium. I was down there for Thanksgiving. I have family in Henderson. I want to get in that stadium. I'm the, you know, I know, any, me too. I'm the biggest Raiders. You think you know a Raiders fan? It's not the Motorhead tour manager. It's me. It's this guy. Right here. <laughs> I'm the guy. I cannot wait to get in there. All I did is walk around for an hour, just taking pictures during Thanksgiving. I haven't seen it yet. I'm dying to see it, but yeah. It's right there. All right, right. dude. Yeah. Thank you so I gotta much. I got to go let my wife in, but yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Let's keep in touch either way. And good luck with everything. Keep me posted on your progress. Thanks, buddy. Talk to you soon. Or as we say in Canada, progress. Progress. <laughs> gotcha. Talk to you awesome, later. dude. Take care.